All right. So um, next Monday, uh, instead of the cloud course on Monday, that session is moved to Tuesday morning. And then we will have the normal cloud course on Wednesday. And then again, uh, go link with, the, with, with our uh, advanced programming on Thursday. So we like normally you would have four sessions in a week, uh, two cloud sessions and two advanced programming sessions. Instead, for the next two weeks, you will have three sessions, the, the, the students who are with the advanced programming, because the cloud people will have two sessions, right? So Monday session from cloud is um, moved to, to the advanced programming on Tuesday. And then we, uh, the, the advanced programming group that has cloud as well, will have sessions on Tuesday, 8.30, uh, Wednesday, 10, I, I think and then the normal cloud slot, and then 8.30 on Thursday. So we will have three sessions. The uh, data engineers, they will have two sessions for cloud, but one of those sessions is Tuesday with us. Okay, so instead of four sessions, you have three, and they will have two, but the um, cloud is moved from Monday afternoon to Tuesday. Uh, so Christopher made an announcement in the cloud course, and I will sort of do the similar announcement today in this course, such that it's uh, double reinforced, and then nobody should show up on Monday evening for the next two weeks. Um, I was thinking not running the, uh, the second session, but I think it would be useful for us to talk a little bit more about some of the features of Golang that we kind of need to explore in, in this course, but they are not necessary for the um, for the cloud course. So for example, we will compare Golang with um, some of the features from C++ and Haskell, and, um, and we don't need to do that for cloud. Like the data engineers, they only need to use it for the cloud uh, for programming there, uh, but they don't need to go kind of deep into the semantics or into the theory of the of the language itself okay so that that's the the basic plan um for the cloud in the past i can check it with christopher um the understanding and knowledge of golang was required and it is in the test at the end so you will be asked to demonstrate your ability to program in golang in the cloud course but because you are also learning uh, Haskell and um, and uh, Rust, even without uh, the advanced programming course in the previous years, we had some students who were doing some assignments and doing a project using Rust. So I think Christopher will be okay if you use a different language to implement some of the assignments or do something with another language but you will still need to know Golang because Golang is kind of like a requirement, is a, a learning objective of the cloud course. And in the final exam, uh, you do have to demonstrate that you know how Golang works and you can program in Golang, okay? So even if you uh, decide to do project in another language, bear in mind that it's good to do assignments <clears throat> to do something in Golang such that you demonstrate that, that you know it. Uh, but I will confirm it with Christopher that he's okay with that. We, we were okay with that, you know, last time we were running the course, but this time around he's in charge of the course. So, you know, I don't want to make a decision. Uh, we, we will kind of make the decision together. So uh, I will check with him and confirm that. But usually from, yeah, from fourth semester onwards, most programming assignments are language agnostic. You can kind of do them in whatever you want with the exception of mobile course where uh, you cannot use JavaScript and do web applications. You have to use some native technology for doing the, the mobile programming. Um, yeah, anyway, um, let's move on. So um, we got stuck uh, on Tuesday with the type parameters. Um, so I was kind of explaining uh, that for the type declaration, the, uh, we using it's a little bit confusing initially because we're using the same kind of letters. Uh, so I was kind of highlighting the. Uh, let me see uh, what do I have. I was doing hello world right. So let's see what we were doing. So 
uh, move. Yeah, so we were kind of explaining that I can have um, I can have a type parameter here, which will make this function polymorphic because I didn't specify any constraint on the type, uh, or I can use a concrete type, uh, and then I'm kind of um, making it less polymorphic or non-polymorphic at all if I kind of constrain of what that is. So if I um, if I use the um, if I use uh, no specification of the type here, then the 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 type of um, um, yeah. So here you, you you see the compiler is complaining that um, I said I don't care what type is it, but then I'm using the plus operator and the compiler says, look, I'm uh, I'm fine with you defining a function which takes whatever, but you know, you actually saying that this whatever has to be able to be used with the addition and things that can be used with addition are of the num type class. So, you know, you're doing something wrong because you told me that it can be anything, but in fact, I can infer that it has to be of num type, right? So that's why we have this um, uh, constraints or type class specifications. So I can, oops. I can say that it is kind of whatever, but because I need to do addition with it, it actually is that um, um, that uh, a is you know limited to only numerical types. So a can be anything as long as it's a numerical type, right? Um, so this this is a type parameter. This is a um, type constraint, type parameter constraint. Uh, and then um, we have just normal variables here. So the normal variable is um, uh, yeah, using small letters as well, and they are separated by, by space. So, uh, you know, uh, in, in uh, C-like programming languages, that would be fun. And then parameter list will be in brackets. And then I would have int A, and then I would be specifying what the return type is. If uh, we're using C, it would be here. So I would be saying, okay, I'm taking an int parameter and returning int. In fact, because I said, I, I don't care if it's int or float, this function is polymorphic, right? So I, I kind of need to be um, generic here, right? Um, the, the polymorphism and the genericity of functions in Haskell are slightly different the, the, to the ones in, in C and um, C++. So um, let me, yeah, so let me just type here. So for example, if I were to, uh, to do something similar uh, using templates in, in C++, uh, I would say um, I have a template um, and the template takes, um, um type name and i would usually use t right and then i would say i have something that returns t and i call it yeah fun and it takes um two parameter uh, in our case one parameter uh and it does something right uh, so i would kind of define a, a, a template for a function uh, and this t would be this type parameter. So same as I have a here, right? So in C++, uh, you do have this ability to express certain polymorphism. Um, and you also have a concept of a kind of a type parameter. And this type parameter is here. The only thing that uh, is different, that there are two d differentiating things. One, one is that I cannot really constrain what t is. Um, I, I have some type parameter and then normally I have, um, yeah, just I can just do stuff with it. And then if I'm doing something illegal, the compiler or the linker will complain. Uh, but in Haskell and in some languages, we can constrain here what T has to be for this to be able to be instantiated, right? Uh, so for example, I can say, I can say I want to call fun with int and then I, I pass into it, or I can call fun. Um, uh, I can call fun with float, and then I can you know uh, call with it like this, right? Um, 
Similarly, here I can um, I can in Haskell I can call fun with one, and I can call fun with one dot one. Right? You see that uh, there is a little bit more magic going on here because this function is polymorphic, and I am not specifying what type I'm calling here. This polymorphism is kind of inferred by the uh, compiler and runtime system. Whereas here I have to be quite specific of what do I mean? Like which version of fun do I really mean? And here I kind of mean the one for float, right? So you can um, you, you can criticize it and say, yeah, you know, that's kind of cheating because you know, if, if I don't have polymorphisms like in C and I call this function float uh, and I do this and I call this function int, and I do this, what's the difference, right? That they are kind of two different functions anyway, right? Which is true, like in, in C++, this templating and this kind of a polymorphism is really compiled in and it kind of is like two different functions and I am picking the one which I mean here precisely. Whereas here, I have a bit more flexibility, like, you know, it, it feels much more dynamic. Uh, it feels, you know, less, um, strict in a sense, I, I mean, it's still strict. This is the version with float, right? It, uh, you know, the Haskell will use the version with float here, uh, but it feels it is the same function, which is used for different types. Whereas here, it kind of feels those are two different functions. They really don't have anything in common, right? So if I write it like this, or if I write it like this, you know, it's just a syntactic, you know, it's just a little bit of a syntactic fluff but is fun really the same function? Like maybe, um, you know, it's a little bit different. So anyway, you, you do have that. And then in C++20, so if I kind of Google it, um, C++20 uh, concepts. There is, um, um, yeah, so for example, maybe this will not, um, uh, this one is a little bit too messy. Let's see. The reference libraries are usually good. Um, require. Yeah, that's not too good neither. Let me see basic concepts, but that will be about con, that's not about the concepts. Okay, maybe here. So concepts is an extension to the, yeah, that one is really good. So let me uh, make it bigger. So, you know, usually we, we did something like here. So we usually had a template we had the type parameter and then we did, you know, a function or a class parameterized by that type. And then you can instantiate it using this kind of a generics concept, right? So I'm kind of saying, oh, I really want fun for int or fun for float, right? Uh, but I couldn't constrain it to say T has to be numerical type, same as I did here in Haskell. But in C++20, they said, yeah, that's a really good idea to have this kind of a concept of types for types, right? So this is, you know, what, what is num? Um, so if I go, uh, let's, let me quit that. And we go to the interpreter and I say, what is num? And it's a, I don't know what num is because it's a, it's a kind, it's a type of a type. So I have to ask it, okay, what kind is num? And it says, you know, it's a, uh, uh, it num is a function. You see, it takes a parameter and returns a value or it returns something. So num really is a function which takes a primitive type because you know, remember, like if I ask what um, what string is, it says, oh, a string is a primitive type, right? So star represents primitive type. Same for int and bool and so on. So what num is? Num is a function which takes a primitive type and returns a constraint. And that's how we've used it. Like what we did, we said fun is the uh, type of A is constrained uh, by this function such that when I say um, it takes A and returns A, there is a certain constraint 
on top of this type, right? I'm kind of specifying the type here and, you know, uh, um, you remember how we do types in, um, in Haskell? Like if I say, let A be um, N, but I want A to be an int, I do this, right? So the type comes after, right? The type of things usually comes after and it, it uses this double um, dot notation. So here, when I said this fun is a, the type of fun is something that is constrained by A, uh, one weird thing is like you'd say, okay, if I'm constraining what A is, should the A constraint be like this? Would 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 it make more sense, right? So I'm I'm saying uh, A has a certain type, and then when I'm doing this, I kind of do, you know, specify what A is. But num is not really a type. Num is actually a function, right? That's why I'm doing a function on A. Right, so num is a function and a is a parameter for this for this function, and that's the constraint. It returns the constraint, and then I can do I can do this. So in C plus plus twenty, you have similar concept, which is called concept. So then you you basically have um, you have the normal um, you know templates with the um, with the um, uh, the, the same structure as, as I, I was showing before, but additionally, you have um, the concept of what um, T has to be such that it will constrain um, uh, the type. So you can uh, have uh, concepts which are like um, integral or um, similarly to, um, to, to things that you have in Haskell, like you can have hashable, you can have different things that you want to constrain what T has to be to be able to be instantiated in this place when you kind of instantiated the, the library. So you have concepts and they also have kind of a, um, a term called traits. Uh, and then you can constrain, like for example, here I'm saying, um, you know, T has to be um, um, integer like in integral is like the uh, integral in Haskell. So they they kind of um, re-implemented some of these things into C plus plus twenty, and they will be uh, then you will be able to kind of uh, uh, restrict of what certain um, um, certain constraints on the on this type parameter are. So it it is kind of the same, uh, but the mechanics and how it is implemented is slightly different, and of course the notation is is kind of um, uh, yeah more complex in the C plus plus side of things. Uh, we will not deal with that in in C plus uh, plus this lecture. We may come back to it when we talk about uh, type classes and traits in Rust. So then we will compare all three. Um, I just wanted to kind of reinforce, um, like for now, all you really need to um, differentiate is uh, where we do um, when when we use a type parameter and it's called typically a and when we use a parameter of a function which can also be called a so you know just make sure that you conceptually understand what's going on here uh, the details we will come back to it rust has something like this c plus plus has something like this and then uh, golang doesn't for example right so in golang you cannot do any of that uh, you don't have generics and you don't have kind of higher order types um, such that it makes the language, uh, you know, more primitive, you, you could say. Um, okay, so uh, can you explain the difference between the double arrow and the single arrow? So um, good question. So if I like delete this C++ things. All right, so let me do uh, this be, be without the double arrow. Uh, the single arrow is, um, this, this is a little bit weird also because normally uh, in other programming languages, what, what I have, I have some sort of name of a function. They ha have a, a parameters um, there's, and they could be comma separated or enclosed in brackets or something like this. And then the third thing I have is the uh, return 
type, right? So I have um, the name of the function. I have some list of parameters that the function takes. And then I have usually a return type. And in some languages, I can have a return, return type and variable, right? So for example, in, um, in C, you have return type, but you cannot name what the return variable is because that the language doesn't allow you to do. Then I have a name and then I have some parameters which are parameter list for that function. And, um, and uh, what I can have is I can have like this um, and then I specify the type. So the A and B are parameters. If the function takes just one, I will have one. And then you have a type of that parameter. Uh, in Golang, you, if you're defining a fun, you will say um, there is a function fun which takes a which is an int and returns an int, but you can name it. So you can say, well, the, the return thing is actually called b, right? Uh, and then when you come on, when you are writing the body of the function, uh, you can say that b equals 10, and that's it. And then you don't really need a return statement because b has been bound to the return and the return is b, so therefore you, you know you're done. Uh, in C, because you cannot name the return thingy, then you always have to say return, right? Uh, so that's the, the general structure of, structure of the function. So now in Haskell, we have this weird arrow, which is like, you could say, yeah, it's sort of like a comma, but it's not really like a comma because sometimes it's like the final type of the, of the thing. So this is an equivalent of a C, which is like fun A uh, returns A. So it, it's like this template, which I did. So it takes a type A and returns a type A, right? Um, so it, it it is a type specification. Um, and now that, that's what single arrows is. So if I add one more, uh, it means that this function actually takes two parameters and returns one. Right, so it takes a and it takes a and it returns a. So it is kind of like this, um, right? And um, then you have some variables, right? So uh, the the type is a, but the name you have to name the variables, the parameters, right? So I have one parameter, second parameter, and return. That's what single arrow is. Um, and then if I add one more, uh, then it gets kind of, it takes three parameters, right? So in here, it would be an equivalent of AZ. If I make them into brackets, so for example, I say the, I have something like this. Um, that would mean that fun actually takes two parameters. This is one parameter. And this is the second parameter, and then it, it returns this, right? So what is this? Uh, this is a function which takes one parameter and returns the same type. So it takes int and returns int, or takes float and returns float, right? Um, so if, if I kind of embrace it into brackets, I, I'm making it into a one thing, not two things. So now I have one thing, second thing, and the final thing. So the fun, fun will take two parameters and the parameters will be, the first parameter is, uh, it takes a function which, um, so that's the type of the, of the function. And I have, let's say I call it F. Uh, and then I have A as the second parameter. And then I don't have a third parameter and then I, I return A, right? So a single arrow is, um, sometimes de depicting what is the parameter list and sometimes depicting what is the output out, uh, um, output of the function. Um, the double arrow is the constraint on the types. So here, if I have a double arrow here um, in, in this place, I will have some constraint which constrain what A can be uh, as I was explaining with the templates in, in C++, right? So the double arrow means constraint and the single arrow means um, output or parameter list. In Haskell, it, it, it's not really, like Haskell is really weird in a sense that um, 
all functions, I, I will talk about it later. So I, I don't want to start this. Uh, so for now, um, treat the single arrow either as a, as a parameter list uh, divider or as a return type thingy. And then this, the double arrow is constraint on a type that follows from on the right hand side. Uh, does it make sense? Uh, there was a required keyword on the first base. Uh, I, I don't, can you, um, Sebastian, can you re, re ask the question? Like, give me a little bit more context. What, what do you mean? All right, so this, yeah, this is what we had here. Yeah, I will write that. Oh yeah, and, and you probably meant in C++ there is a required keyboard. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's right. So there is kind of a required um, a keyword which you can use to constrain in C++20, you can constrain what the pipe has to fulfill such that you, you can instantiate it. Yeah, uh, thanks. So I, I couldn't find it, I, I skipped that. All right, so that's functions. It's, we will kind of uh, talk about it more uh, because we, we haven't covered all the function things in Haskell yet, uh, but I kind of move on and I have a little bit more about it uh, a bit later. So tuple is a useful type. Um, I think I, let me just double check standard pair, right? You have in C++. Um, yeah, so in, in, um, in C++ there is something called pair uh, and you can instantiate it. It, it, it uses generics, uh, same as Haskell. Uh, so such that you can constrain what type it will be. And then you have kind of like a struct, which is, uh, which is a pair of things. Uh, so in Haskell it's the same. Um, so you can, um, let's do this. Um, in, if I say let A be a pair of things, I can do it like this. Uh, and then I can ask what type is A, and it will tell me, well, A is a pair. Uh, in Haskell language, you know, you, you, uh, um, you call it tuple. Um, and then it has two things. It has one thing which is of type A, one thing which is of type B. Both types have to be numeric because that's what the, uh, that's what I initialized it with, right? If I initialize it with, um, with a number of, and, and a string and I ask what type is it now, it will tell me, well, A is, we don't know what, but it's definitely a numeric type. It doesn't know if it's float or fractional or whatever, uh, but this one is definitely, a, you know, a, a string, a sequence of characters. So it says, okay, um, type of A is, is this. Um, and, and, um, you see a here means the variable I have that the kind of the, the symbol that I um, defined. So this is the left hand side a and then this a has nothing to do with this a. That's, that's what I meant that it's sometimes confusing that this is the kind of the instance or you can call it like a variable. It, it, it cannot vary it. It's like uh, bound to, to, this, uh, to this value, right? It's sort of like a reference to this value and it's called a. But this A is a type parameter, which says it's a certain type, which we don't know what it is, but we know it's a numerical type. And again, you have here this uh, double arrow, which is a constraint on what this A is, right? Um, so tuples are useful. Um, in C++, I'm not sure if you have a triple. Uh, I, I know th this, this one is quite useful if you want to return to things and, and so on. Uh, but in Haskell, uh, tuples can be more than two things. So I can say A really is three things. Um, the, the, the final one is uh, float, right? So now if I check what type is, it says, okay, the first thing is some number, could be float, could be integer, we don't know. Uh, second thing is here, uh, it doesn't have any constraints. So it's just a string, it's a primitive type with no constraints. And then the final thing is called C, and C is fractional. So we know 
it's not just a generic number. It has to be a fractional number because we have this comma. So we have type of float, right? So it's either float or double, presumably, right? So Haskell is inferring that. Um, you see here that uh, if I meant integer, Haskell would not define this as integer, right? So usually when, you, uh, when you're doing your own uh, functions or your own um, um, variables or kind of the, 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 the symbols that you need to define, usually you are kind of, you don't have to do it because Haskell will infer the types for you, uh, but it's useful if you um, define the types because then if you ask Haskell what A is, it will tell you what you want, right? So it will use your types uh, to, to understand what you mean by one, right? Uh, th th this uh, literal is polymorphic. So as I said, it can be a double, can be a, a float, can be a um, integer and, and so on, or big integer. Uh, so so in, in Haskell, we have two types of integers. We have int and we have integer, right? Int is like a normal integer, like in other programming languages bound by kind of a max value. So if you own uh, 32 bits or 64 bits, you have a, a certain max int and then it kind of overflows. So if you add one to the max int, it will kind of go to negatives. Um, integer is a, um, it's also kind of like an uh, int, but it doesn't have minimum or maximum number. It goes forever. Like you can have arbitrary large numbers represented uh, and it will never overflow. So if you have calculations that should not overflow, you should, you should use integer. So if you're implementing, you know, a Bitcoin wallet uh, and you have kind of an account value, uh, if you use normal ints and they overflow, suddenly you get to some trouble, right? You should use something that will never overflow. Otherwise you're risking yourself some serious problems. Uh, but the drawback of integers is that, they, of course, they are slower. They occupy more memory and they have to deal with this kind of infinite uh, range such that operations like additions and things like that on integers are slower. So if you don't need it, we usually use the more primitive one, which has a bound, right? Uh, but anyway, um, my point here is that even though in Haskell you don't need to do this type definitions for your functions or for your uh, structs or for whatever you're doing, uh, it's useful to do that. I get into trouble uh, sometimes because I don't specify the type and then I have kind of a more complex pro program and then the compiler complains. And I was like, what the hell? Like it, it, it worked like just before it, everything worked fine and now it complains. Uh, and it happens that sometimes I, I mean like int uh, and I make certain assumptions that it has to be int and then the inferred type is num and then I get into some problems because not all ints can be nums, right? So for example, if I, um, if, if I have an int and it has to be used as, a, uh, as um, some other type, I actually have to explicitly do type conversions. And then uh, if you don't specify the types and they don't, the inferred one is not what you meant, and then you make assumptions, then you may get into problems. So usually it's good to, to do this. And it's also a form of documentation. So when you're writing uh, Haskell functions and you specify what types they have, it is a way of documenting what that function will do because you kind of explicit of what you mean by those uh, parameters. Like, you know, remember the, the, the definition of A, um, of fun? Uh, if I do something like this, um, yeah, I mean, with plus it's obvious, but if, if I have something to do with A, I, I have some code here. Uh, just by reading this, you will not know uh, what, you know, what is, what is it? Uh, but if I have a type definition, uh, which says it's a function which take a user and returns an account, um, well, you know, then it's obvious like what later, what fun is using, like what is the A parameter of fun? You know, it has to be of type user and I'm kind of uh, uh, returning an account or um, let's say username maybe. Uh, and then it returns an account of that user or something like this, right? So specifying types is as a good good practice, um, right? So that kind of covers. Um, I again, I'm, I'm ranting too much. Uh, where is it here? No, here. So I, I should talk about tuple, and we back to to talking about functions. Um, right? No questions. Right. So let's move on. Uh, lists. Lists. Uh, 
super fundamental in um, uh, how do I do this? Yeah. So um, if you worked with lists before, uh, none of this will be um, strange to you. If you didn't work with lists, you have to get into habit of thinking about lists as a useful data structure, right? Uh, so lists are represented in square brackets. Um, in, and then you have the, uh, the content. So if I have numbers, uh, I can have something like this. Uh, if I have uh, characters, uh, so if I do, if I do this, uh, this is exactly the same as this, right? It's just a syntax which makes it different, but ABC is just a syntactic sugar for this because you know, string, string is a, an alias of, um, of this, right? So the, the type string is an alias of an array of characters and then the literals, which are represented like this, are just a syntactic sugar for, for this. And then this in itself, this in itself is a syntactic sugar for something else, which is, um, which is this. So this is really what a list is. It's the concatenation of elements uh, this operator, which is listed here, uh, is an operator which uh, con concatenates um, an element and the list. That's why the last one uh, is concatenating C to the last element, which is an empty list, right? So um, if, if I do ask, okay, tell me what is uh, this um, operator, it will say, well, this operator is a function which takes an element of some type A and an array or list of this type and returns me a list of this, of this type, right? So I, I have the left-hand side parameter or the first parameter is an element and the second one is the, um, um, is the list. So because it, it is a <clears throat> um, prefix uh, notation. So I, I would say A concatenated with a list of B and C will give me ABC, right? So this is just an item and this is a, a list and the list has two, par um, two elements and then this one kind of comes at, at, in, in front. Um, so remember that uh, those, um, I lost the, the thing, but you know, uh, this and the empty list is exactly the same. So this is just a syntactic expression of ABC or this uh, A, B, C. Make sense? It's just syntax. Um, you know, semantically they are all lists, and the constraint is that the list, as you see here, the list elements have to be of the same type. So I cannot have a list which is um, list of lists being an element of a list which already has two elements which are just characters. I cannot have that. Um, so let me let me do this. So let let's try to pretend that I will try to have a list of three elements, which is like this. And it says, oh, no, that's impossible, right? Uh, it's impossible because um, this is a list like Haskell reads this and he says, um, well, she says, it's a list of characters, right? It says the type of this list elements is car, but this is, an array of cars, which is different than car. So, you know, you have a problem. Um, so I cannot have that, but if I make them, whoops, if I make these into also arrays, uh, lists, lists of characters, then it's fine, right? I have a list now, it's a list of lists 
And the elements of this list is a list of characters. So if I ask, okay, let's do this. Let's call it A. Uh, if I say, tell me what uh, type of A is, it will say, yeah, it's a list of lists of characters. Right? I can have a list of lists of uh, integers as well. So I can have, uh, let's just do two. So I have a list of two elements and uh, it, it's a number. So if I do this and say it's a list of integers and ask what, what you are, it says, I'm a list of integers. And now if I say um, I have a list, oops, a list of uh, empty list and a list of uh, three and four. And then I have to, if I don't specify the type, it will say it's an, those are numbers. So if I ask what type you are, it's a list of lists. Yeah, no, no big magic here. Uh, and then you have certain functions. So you have like, let's say, uh, what did we define? Yeah, uh, let's define something simpler though. So let's define this, um, three and four. And then let's say let A is this, and then the type, it, it will be a list of integers, um, the type of A. Uh, yes, it's a list of integers. And then I can say uh, head of A, and you know we expect this element, right? So the head, we can ask what type head function is. And you will see that it takes a list of some type and returns the first element of that type. And as you see, there is no constraint. It works for any type. It doesn't matter like whether there are numbers or whatever, it's a polymorphic function. It doesn't care what type the list is of. Um, and then it returns the, that the element of the type of that list. So if I, if I say head A, I'm kind of expecting to get um, number one, which is the first element. And then tail is the, the, you know, the rest of the list, right? So the elements without the tail. Again, you can ask what tail is and you get that a tail takes a list and returns a list uh, of some type, but you don't really see uh, what that is. Uh, funny enough, um, so uh, let, let's do something, um, something more before I jump there. So length, is a function which takes a list and returns you the length of that list. So in our case, we have four elements, one to four, and then, then we get it. One useful thing here is that we also have ranges. And if you want to type, like if I want to type a list from one to 100, uh, I would kind of kill myself just typing it here. So what you can do is you can kind of do uh, think, things like this, and it um, kind of abstracts away that what you mean is like uh, going by one, and then the 100 is the last element. So it kind of generates a list for you. Uh, so you, it's again a sy syntactic sugar for doing this, right? Um, so if, you know, instead of uh, typing sequences of things, you can, you, you can do that. So things, um, so again, if I ask, okay, uh, tell me what dot dot is. Um, yeah, it, it's not a function, it's a, it's a syntax. So it, it, it doesn't have the explanation here, uh, but um, I can also do that for um, um, anything that has order, uh, you can use those two dots. So for example, I can specify um, something like this. And because characters are effectively bytes and the bytes have order, it will kind of uh, generate an array. Ah. I'm kind of, you know, this is the, the notation Golang, which, which is a notation for arrays. Uh, in, in Haskell, those are lists. So when, when I, every time I say array is a mistake, it's a list. Uh, it's an array in Golang. Um, so anyway, uh, it, it generates a list of characters for me and it goes from A by one all the way to Z, right? Interestingly, if I go, I want every second character, it will do the same, right? It will go every second character. Uh, so you can express the, the step, like the, the jump you want to do. Um, and it also knows how to do uh, backwards. So if I go 199 and I want to go to one, maybe let's do by two, uh, it will kind of understand that as well. 
Uh, but there is a limit of how much it can understand it. It basically understands only the step, uh, like in plus or minus, and then the max and min. If you try to be quite smart here, if you want, you know, power of two or something like this, it will not do that. Um, so we have some functions here. Uh, and then you may say, oh, do I need to memorize all of this? And the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, you do need to memorize those six functions uh, because looking them up would be just so inefficient. But in general, uh, you don't memorize all the library functions that the language has. So different languages have kind of a library support and they have a, a, a huge number of functions. Um, and then, you know, you do need to have some help. And uh, as I showed you here, the help, for example, for tail is somewhat limited because it tells you, well, it, it kind of uh, takes a list and returns a list. And sometimes it's enough for you to understand what it's doing. But sometimes you want a little bit more. You want some sort of description. Um, so the, the best way to do that is to go to, um, there is a, um, yeah, so, if you go uh, haskell.org and you click on the documentation tab, uh, let's make it bigger. Um, then at the bottom, you have something called Google API search. And then it will, yeah, if I go there, it gives you a search bar. And then you can type tail and you can get all the definitions of tail and all kind of standard packages that Google knows about. And usually, if you're dealing with base language, if you constrain the search to base, uh, then you know you will get the. Um, uh, you you have to see in which packages that definition is. And here we see like uh, the interpreter uses prelude, uh, loads prelude uh, uh, package, and then in the base language we have tail as well, and it's the same definition as we have here. And if I click on it you get uh, usually some sort of description, right? Um, so in the uh, context of tail, it says um, tail takes a list of returns. Uh, let me make it bigger. And it says, um, I lost the, oh, come on. So extracts the elements after the head of the list, which must be non-empty. Uh, this is uh, important, right? And also you need to understand what head is. And then head takes a list and returns an A and it says extract the first element of the list, right? So um, of course you can browse this and like learn about null and length and, and things like this. But the, the five that I showed you here, those are kind of uh, very useful to remember. Uh, some other ones, uh, you may just read the, uh, the documentation and kind of learn about what it does when you need it. Usually, there are functions on whatever you need to do with a list already built in. Uh, you usually don't need to define functions to do with lists because they are all kind of built in, either in prelude or in base package or in data.list uh, module. Um, so um, it's useful resource. So, so every time you, you have a function that you see in a code and you're not sure what it does, you can kind of uh, go here and, and do the, uh, the search uh, and get, um, get the description. So it, it's the same we can ask for length. Um, and it, it kind of works the same way, right? Uh, you can see that it is constrained so the, the type T, uh, I mean, the, the, um, the A is constrained that it has to be of a certain kind. Uh, and what it means, it, it, it has to have a property of like a list. You, you, can, you, you can for now think that foldables are, are something that is kind of like a container which has elements inside. Uh, and then it takes this kind of container of, of some type A uh, so T means this kind of foldable, this type of container. And then it returns the, uh, the int, which is the length of that, of that container. Um, there is, um, as, as I said, int 
and num are not the same. Like num is much more generic, int is much more specific. And uh, it's a bit of a um, puzzle that in many languages that th those two things are not kind of the same thing. And often you do need to use it. Uh, you do need to use the length as a num, uh, but then you can convert um, um, int to num, but you have to be explicit about it. All right, so those are the, um, yeah, the, the five functions. So what's the difference between concatenation and this concatenation? Uh, this one takes lists on left and right side. This one takes an item and the list, right? Uh, null checks if the list is empty. Um, and, you, uh, and remember that uh, you cannot do uh, tail uh, on, an, on a list that doesn't have a tail. So if I have a list with one element, uh, I have a list with one element and I say tail. Um, yeah, so th that, that, that works, but I, I cannot say tail on an empty list. So remember that this is a syntactic sugar of what? Of a number one concatenated with an empty list, right? So that's why uh, tail, tail of, of this returns the empty list because this actually has a tail, which is an empty list. But an empty list doesn't have a tail, right? So if I do tail on an empty list, then I get an exception. Um, and the same with, um, so if I do head on an empty list, I have an exception. If I do a head on a list that has one element, th you know, th this one element is uh, one plus the empty list. So, so the difference between this and this is that, um, if you if you remember this, so if I do um, hello, right? I cannot. So character plus a list is with this, but if I have um, is with plus. Right. If I try to do that here, it's a wrong parameter. Right. The left hand side needs to be an item, not a list uh, for this one. So item and the list. This one, list and the list. And they kind of uh, concatenate the, uh, the two things together. Right. So plus plus, uh, string with string, um, this uh, character with the list then you know the difference uh, between these two. All right. Um, yeah, how, how, we, uh, how we get the elements of the tuple? Good, very good question. So if I have a tuple, um, if I have a tuple A, uh, which is, um, let's say I have again two numbers, um, then if I want to call uh, the, the first one, uh, how how do you do that in um, in C plus plus? How do you get the first element of the tuple? I believe you have. Um, let's see. You have. Um, So you have the first and second, right? So what you do is you you define uh, you say I have a standard pair pair uh, of int and int and it's p um, I don't know something like this. But then when you want to access the first element, you say first, or if you want to access the second one, you say second, right? So you kind of do this dot notation. And you have those two fields like uh, the members, which is called first and second, which are of those uh, you know appropriate types. Yeah, remember that in tuples, the two types don't have to be the same. In list, everything needs to be the same type, but in tuples it doesn't. So in C plus plus, you have first and second, right? So how would you do that in function as a function, right? So if I have let a is one and two. 
of course, we don't have this dot notation like um, that, that is gone in, in Haskell, but we have functions. So probably it's first, right? But, you know, it's not because first is too much to type. So they call it first like this, right? So we have first and second. Uh, so that's how you get the first and second element of the of the tuple, right? Um, there is no function for the third one, but we can quickly define one, right? Um, so there is uh, this kind of a nice uh, pattern matching happening in functions. So if I uh, want to have third <laughs> defined on a tuple such that I don't care what the first parameter is, I don't care what the second parameter is, and then I want the final parameter to be called Z and I want to return Z, um, then I have kind of like a function, which is called third, which takes three things. Uh, I mean, it takes one thing, which is a tuple, uh, but the uh, I'm kind of um, decomposing the, because it, you know, it, it is kind of a syntactic sugar again for saying third takes a tuple, and then I am uh, letting the, um, um assigning i don't care i don't care z to uh, be taken out of t and then i kind of return uh return the final one right it's more compact uh, i'm returning z it's more compact to kind of specify it like this um and then if i have a tuple so if i called third on our a it will say ah oh, wait a minute yeah you know uh, third expects three things, but A doesn't, it's, it's a kind of a thing about C that uh, doesn't exist in A because A only has A and B, right? But if I uh, let have three elements and I call third on A, then it returns me the, the third element, right? Yeah, Syndra is good, F first and second, exactly. That's how we do it in C++. Um, so in, yeah, in Haskell, we have that. And again, okay, magic functions, this FST and SND. So again, you can go to, um, where do I have it, to Hugo, And you can say, okay, uh, tell me about SND, right? And SND, fair enough, says, okay, SND takes a tuple of two things and returns you the, the second thing, right? Uh, so you, you can kind of check things out and you can uh, read the, um, the description. So it, it basically says extract the second component of a pair. Um, so Google is very useful. It's kind of like an interactive um, API lookup. Uh, you have it for all languages that you use and it's kind of a useful tool uh, to have it handy and to, um, to browse through it uh, when, when you're dealing with, um, with the different types. All right, so um, let's move on. Uh, we have, um, in Haskell, we have something that is called list comprehension. And this is a very concise notation to deal with lists. So for example, if I, um, let's, let's say, um, I quit that. Uh, let's go to our hello thingy. And I want a list. Um, uh, yeah, let's delete this main stuff. So I, I want to um, to make a list that is uh, the, the powers of two, right? Uh, from uh, one to hundred. Uh, and then I am doing it in C++. Uh, then what I would have to do is I would have to kind of uh, declare, declare some sort of a list uh, initially, uh, have some sort of a for loop um, that goes from my initial starting point to the um, to, to the end, uh, and then kind of um, uh, add um, new elements, which are like the i square, right? So I'm kind of a squaring um, the the elements and then return the final list, right? So that's what I would do kind of imperatively. I would say, okay, for a list like this, uh, two, four, uh, eight, uh, blah, 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 all the way to a power of uh, to 100 times 100. So 
100 times no uh, yeah then i would kind of um have something like this um i'm squaring the numbers then the 100 times 100 yes that that should work so i to, to get this i would have to do this kind of imperative um sequence right but if you if you think about what it is uh, not how to do how to achieve it like what it is right it is a list uh and then i have uh constructed it by uh squaring the elements of another list right so if if, uh, if, if you de de uh, de um, decompose my way of thinking here so what i have is i have a list from one to 200 and then that's my kind of initial list this is what my kind of a loop is right i'm, I'm going from one to hundred and that's i can represent it as a list and then the other list is kind of um the i squared from from this list right so if i call this one uh l and i call this kind of final final list that i want uh then i have something like this i'm kind of taking elements from l and then i'm squaring them to uh, to obtain the final list right and that's what uh list comprehension is in in haskell it has kind of like a kind of a, a, a generator part and then kind of the bar and some sort of um um yeah so so the generator is here generator and some conditions and then before the bar you have kind of an expression that is using a variable from the generator uh, and the notation in, in Haskell, uh, many languages, many programming languages have list comprehension. Uh, and it's very useful kind of a concept because it allows you to express what something is more succinctly than doing this imperative sort of loop sequence, right? So in our case, uh, what I would need to do is I would need to say, okay, I need I square uh, from a generator which draws I from another list, which is my list from one uh, to 100. And then I have no other constraints. So I don't um, constrain it by any, any means, right? And this is basically, uh, so this is basically this, uh, using this as a, as a, as a generator, um, as a source for calculating that, right? So if I go, um, if I go to the interpreter again, and I say this, and I say this i square two, uh, I'm drawing i from another list, which is yeah. Let's make it smaller so that we don't get overflow with prints. Um, it you know I. Um, yeah, so in, in, in this example, when I say two for eight, <laughs> of course, the power of three is not eight, the power of three is nine. So um, um, then we have this, this list kind of generated uh, using this list comprehension. I can say, um, I can, for example, do this. I can say, um, uh, go all the way to 100, but I want I square uh, to be less than a uh, thousand okay so i don't want any powers that are bigger than thousand uh in the resulting list so i added a condition a, a this additional constraint in this list comprehension uh and then i will have you know from one to nine six one because the next power of two of the next number would kind of exceed that that number right so i, I kind of put the the constraint here uh, you can use the same variables uh, that you are um, doing in the generator part um, in the constraints and in the expression. Um, of course, the expression can, can be anything. So I can construct, um, uh, let's, let's do a, a, a simple one where I am generating pairs. So I'm gonna generate a pair of ints, which will be one, one, two, two, three, three, and so on to 10, right? So I have now uh, 10 pairs. Um, can I generate 
Um, so let's rename it to X. Um, can I generate X, Y and use another generator for Y? Well, let's try. Yes, I can, right? And as you see, it actually makes all permutations, right? So it, it, it is kind of like two nested loops. Uh, first, I have um, the X going, um, so, so first I have the, the, the first expression bounding it to one, and then it goes kind of an inner loop from one to 10, right? So I have one, 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 two, because the Y becomes two. So after one, I have one, and then here I have two, and it kind of binds the, the second one until it reaches 10. And then once this one is exhausted, it increments that one because I'm, I'm drawing the next one from the list and going again here, right? So I'm, I'm kind of generating um, x, y pairs by exhaustively going through this list and this list. And this one is the inner one, and this one is the outer one. Um, so it, it is kind of like having an imperative programming, having like two nested loops, uh, the one going from one to 10 for X and then in inner loop going from one to 10 for Y. And I'm kind of going over hundred times um, through the, the, the inner block. And the inner block is this, is this, this final expression, right? Um, do you have any questions of that, about that? It, it is, um, if, you, if you never use list comprehensions, then it might be a bit weird to feel this. But if you've used pass, um, Python or if you used uh, other programming languages with list comprehensions, then you will get used to list comprehensions much more than doing uh, loops. Uh, because the loops are a little bit messy. You have to deal with a, a bit of boilerplate coding. Uh, whereas with list comprehensions, you can have things done in a kind of a succinct way. Uh, and they allow you to express kind of um, you know, quite complex logic in a more um, declarative way. So, so yeah, it's useful to combine uh, list comprehensions with ranges. So every time you are thinking in normal C program about the loop from one to something or from something to something, most often or not, you can express it as a list comprehension. Sometimes you cannot, but sometimes you can. Uh, so it is often a replacement for a need for a loop uh, in, in imperative programming. All right, so let's see some more useful functions that we have on lists. Um, those are all functions which are, uh, which are defined in prelude, which we can test here. Uh, so those are all list functions. Um, let me keep them here so we can quickly test them. So let define A to be a list. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, about list comprehensions, um, you can, um, yeah, you can, let me see, let, let's do this one. So um, here I have uh, the power, not power of two, I have powers of the numbers from one to 100 and I constrain it to only take the powers which are smaller than thousand. But in fact, what I can do is I can say, keep drawing uh, I from an infinite, infinite sequence, right? I can do this, like what, what is this? Um, this goes, this is a list of numbers from one to infinity. Uh, and I say, yeah, you just keep drawing I from a list of from one to infinity, but only print me um, those numbers, right? That, that has certain characteristics. If I didn't have that condition, um, yeah, in, in fact, it kind of, you see, it, it kind of keeps, uh, keeps drawing the numbers. So I got kind of stuck because it, it goes to infinity and it waits because it may happen that one of those numbers will be smaller than thousand and then it will continue printing it, right? So it printed it all the way to here. And now it continues this infinite loop, which I got stuck with uh, because it checks, well, you know, I don't know what, um, that none of the follow-up numbers will not meet that condition. So it kind of, um, 
I, I have to kill it, like I have to control C it, right? So those ranges are possible in Haskell as well. So, uh, you know, um, you can not, you, you can effectively go to infinity, right? Um, so drop uh, is, um, yeah, so let's let's go in them in order. So if I say I have uh, numbers from one to 10 and I want this to sum them up, I just say sum, right? Uh, and it adds up all the numbers from, from a list from one to 10. I can do the same with product. Um, so those uh, functions, those functions take list and they do what you expect them to do. Take uh, constraints, uh, what, like, what would I cut? So let, let me do this uh, two, three, four, five, and 10. So I have six elements. And, and if I say take, um, take two out of this list, then I will only take the first two elements. If I say take five, I will take the first five, right? So let's take the first two. I will kind of cut the list when I, I, I say like take the first two and then just uh, return the first two. Uh, drop is the opposite. It drops the, the number of elements that, that you say and gives you the rest of the list, the rem uh, reminder of the list. So if I say drop, um, it kind of drops the first two elements and gives you the rest. Um, and then you have the two functions which are called maximum and minimum, which do what you would expect. So if I call minimum on this list, it would return one. If I call maximum, it would return 10. Uh, there, are, there is another function which is called min and max. Uh, and min takes two numbers and returns you the min of those two numbers. And max, again, takes two numbers and returns you the max of those two numbers. Um, you may say, yeah, why we don't use um, polymorphism and call the same, yeah, you know, they do the same thing. It's just one takes a list and one takes two arguments. And that's the reason why they cannot have the same name because if I ask what type is min, uh, you will see that it takes two parameters and returns one thing. And what if I ask what type is maximum, you will see that it takes one parameter and returns the value, right? So if the parameter list changes, like I have, I have to give two things and return one thing. Here I, I need to give one thing and return one thing. Then I cannot uh, make it polymorphic, right? Because um, the the signature kind of is different. Um, so that's why, yeah, uh, you have those two versions. You have min and max, and you have minimum, minimum and maximum for lists. Um, the drop, take, and so on, they are quite useful if you're doing some more complex uh, things with lists. Uh, and then, um, yeah, you need to do some list processing. We will have a kind of a, um, some tasks to, 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 to deal with that. So you will get a few. Um, all right, so now kind of a task for you, right? The list comprehension then produces squares of odd numbers from one to 11. Um, so I think you can start. Uh, I will give you a hint that um, to check if the number is odd, there is a function which is called odd. Um, the function takes, so the odd function takes as you expect, some um, integer-like number uh, and returns whether it's true or false, right? So if I say odd, odd three, it will say true, odd two, it will say false, right? So you can use it in a list comprehension as a condition to constrain the, um, yeah, sorry. I, uh, th thanks Thomas for uh, submitting the Menti, Menti code. So, um, so write a list comprehension that produces squares of odd numbers from one to 11. That should be pretty straightforward. I will um, quit that, uh, clear the screen and restart it. And then we can test what do you have. Um, 
let me see if I can see. Um, that sucks. So this one, yeah, I see your answers, but okay, I can I can show the answers. All right, so we have four proposals so far, and all of them are correct. Um, there are three that use the condition, and one, you may say, a bit more clever one, which uh, ma makes the filtering of odd numbers directly in the, in the expression, right? So very well done. Uh, that's that's great. Um, those who understand it are great. Those who don't understand it yet, um, ask me questions. So what what is confusing or what you don't get? All right, let's do one more. So go to slide, new slide. Um, Um, yes. Oh yeah, what I meant is, um, yeah, why do we have, give me a second. All right, so the, um, uh, there is a mistake. So uh, write a function that takes a list. Um, you know, write a function that produces the uh, the the comprehension, right? So yeah, it's it's trivial. You just have to um, um, yeah, I, I screwed it up. So you, you should say fun equals, and then you should have the list comprehension on the right hand side, right? So the fun doesn't take any parameters, and then when you call it, it will return this uh, list of the squares, right? Uh, so let's skip that. Um, so there is another one, another short task. So this one is also with the function. So write a function called my len that takes a list as an argument that returns the length of the list. Uh, so how would you do that? So the, the define a function called my len that takes a list as an argument and returns the length of that list. Um, you can do that in the interpreter without the declaring the type of the function. Great. So we have uh, some proposals. Let's have a look. So let's start. Um, let's start with the last one. So let's let's use this one, and I will try it. Uh, and then let's try my len on a list which has ten items and it complains that um, we have a non-exhaustive pattern in my len function. Um, the function is correct, but the interpreter says you've declared the function for this pattern, uh, but we don't know what to do if there is an empty list, right? So um, to, to explain it, uh, let me go for a moment to the other editor. Um, so let me uh, define it. So I have my len, uh, my len, and I defined it as a pattern like this, 
and I said um, length length of that, right? But what is what should my len return for this pattern? Uh, it should return zero, right? And we are missing that pattern. So um, if, if you use the square brackets, you are um, kind of uh, declaring a, a particular pattern that you want this function to fit. Uh, whereas if you don't use the square brackets, then you have a parameter, a single parameter of a function, right? So there is a difference. Um, go away. Uh, there is a difference if I say um, if I say this, or if I say this. Often, what what you really meant was this, right? What you meant is that my len takes something uh, and returns the length of that something, and there is a constraint on what that something is because you expect that that something to be a list, right? That will work. So now if I call my length on, on that list, it actually works magically. Like Haskell knows that um, my len takes something that, that is foldable, that is like a list because only the things that are kind of like a list ha have this function, right? But you could declare uh, my len type and then you could say it takes, um, a list of numbers or a list of some type and returns an int, right? You could do that yourself uh, by constraining it to being a, a list of some type. Um, if you don't do that, then Haskell will infer that it's something like it's a container of some sort, which I can count how much stuff is in it because I'm using kind of a length function on it and length function on it can only be used uh, on foldable things, on, on, on containers. So when, when, you, when you specified this, and I'm making this mistake myself quite often, is that what I really meant is, is this. You know, A is, a, is an array, right? Uh, not array, list. So A is a list. Uh, and then you don't need square brackets. If you use square brackets, then you're making a pattern, right? So that's, uh, that's what, uh, what those things are. Yes, so if you, if, um, so let's let's do this one. So this is what we did with with this, right? Um, so that's how it is. And because um, th there is a trick which says, okay, my length takes one parameter, and length takes one parameter. So wh when I say my length, I can skip that one parameter and just define what it is without that one parameter that it will be applied with, right? So that's what I meant in Haskell, all functions by design of the language takes one parameter. Uh, it's a little bit trick that it's kind of a neat trick in the language such that I actually can define it like this. And I can also call it my length with an array. Uh, let's recall, recall it and it will work, right? So I can define my len function which takes one parameter, and I know it takes one parameter because all Haskell functions take one parameter uh, as something to do. And I am skipping this parameter here and this parameter here because it's the same parameter. So I can kind of skip it. I don't need it. Um, so that's, um, it's a kind of a succinct way of, of doing that, right? And then we have, um, we have, uh, couple of um, definitions. We, we have one uh, recursive one, which you know uh, calculates the length of something using a pattern, like th those three use a pattern. Um, and then we have, yeah, so let's do, let's talk about the pattern ones. Uh, the pattern one is clever because when we pass here a list, I can, uh, call it like this and do some stuff with A, and I know A is a list, right? But if I already know A is a list, I can do the structuring. The structuring is um, a way of uh, substituting some sort of value uh, into variables, but using kind of a pattern matching. Um, so a pattern is, I, I know it will be a list, and the list will have a head, 
and it will have a tail, right? So um, usually uh, if you want um, to bind the tail to something, you will kind of use a variable and then you can bind the tail to something and you will use another variable. And by convention, we add S to it, meaning it's a plural, it's a list. Um, in those, um, in this kind of, um, um, whoops, in this uh, recursive call, um, I don't care about the head because I already counted the head. I'm kind of counting the length of the remaining um, tail of the list, right? So the, the length of the list is the head plus the rest, how long is the rest? And that's what this um, that, that ex, uh, expresses. And because I don't care about the head, then I don't need to bind it to any variable such that we, we say uh, underscore. Um, it's similar in uh, some other programming languages that if you don't need to bind something to something, then you just use underscore to say, there is no variable. I am not binding the head to anything. Um, then we have um, a length which uses the, uh, the list comprehension, which says, okay, uh, generate all the elements of the list. We don't need to bind it to anything and then just return one. Uh, and then just add all those ones, right? So what it will do is if I have an array, ah, come on, a list. If I have a list <laughs> of three things, um, so I have a, a list of three things and then I do this list comprehension uh, on it. It will basically turn this list into uh, some of this list, right? And then I will get kind of the number three because I will sum uh, those three ones. Uh, this is a, a, a very neat trick which we often use for processing some documents or for, for doing um, some sort of um, uh, massive data processing because we can kind of uh, generate those partial lists and then do um, uh, an operation which kind of uh, compacts it to some single value or to, to another list that we want as a result. So this, this way of thinking is kind of neat. In, um, if, if you have some sort of a list processing and you're counting things or if you're doing some, some things on it. Um, uh, we have another recursive one and we have um, another recursive one. So those are kind of the same as the, as the last one. So perfect. Um, I had um, the second question was basically the same uh, to do it without the length, um, which we have already done. And then uh, there is um, there is um, let me quickly unfold this. There is so there are certain functions which are not in prelude. So for example, if I say um, what type is uh, permutations? It, it will say, I don't know what permutations is. To, to use those additional functions, uh, there is a module called data list and you can import it. Um, like in all programming languages, you have kind of a modular uh, design of encapsulation of some of the functionality. And then you can say, okay, what permutations are? And it will tell you, okay, it takes a list and it generates all permutations of the elements of that list into a list of lists, right? So if I call permutations of um, one, two, three, then I will get all possible permutations of those three elements as a list of lists of those permutations. So it's useful if you, you know, are uh, doing something with permutations. Uh, intersperse, and intercalate uh, uh, useful things to put stuff in between elements of the list. And then transpose is for, um, if you have rows and columns, uh, you kind of are transposing the list which represents rows and columns into columns and rows. So it kind of uh, transposes the, the elements. Um, so if you look up in Google that data.list, you will get those additional functions that are very useful for the assignment. So the, the two assignments that you will have 
we will represent our data structures and lists, and then you will find some useful functionality in data list, which is not in Prelude, like you have to import it specifically. So check, check that out. Um, all right, so I managed to finish this deck uh, today. Um, if you have questions, then pose them. If you have issues, then pose them as well. Uh, please pose the one about the Haddock. Um, and then what we will do, we will meet on Tuesday and we will digress for two weeks into Golang such that we have a more primitive language um, in which we will express certain things and then we will express the same things in uh, more expressive languages and we will kind of compare pros and cons. Uh, so that's the, the plan for the next, let's say four weeks. In the next two weeks, we will um, focus on Golang. Great, so Sindra got the haddock going. That's, that's great. Any other issues or questions? Yeah, I, I added all the people who requested access to the course, uh, into the course, and I created the, the space in the, uh, in the assignments um, subspace. To get there, you have to use this URL slash AS slash your username. Uh, this is because we don't want that to be visible to anybody, so such that, that there is a, you know, a, a, a privacy con constraint on the visibility, such that you don't really see anybody else's projects. And to get to your one, you have to kind of explicitly type your username into the space, and then you can create uh, as many projects as you need. Uh, so create projects as per assignment or per task, you know, you organize it like the way you want it. And then you will have to open the visibility when the submission happens. Uh, for now, while you all working on it it, it, it is all private. Yeah, I, I made a mistake last week because I made those projects instead of groups. It, it, it needs to be a group such that you have control over the individual projects inside. Any questions? If not, then I will see you on Tuesday. And as I said, we will uh, use Golang. Um, and then I will tell you what, uh, what to do. Um, yeah. All right. So thank you very much. And that's, that's all for today. Yeah, have a good weekend.